Hello and welcome to the Pratt Falls Podcast, the show that features conversations with people about the work they make and the life they live. I'm your host, Levi Weinhagen. You can find me on Twitter at that Levi. You can find all past episodes of the show on prattfallspod.com. You can also find it on anywhere you get podcasts. All the episodes are there. Go listen to them if you haven't yet. This is my conversation with Chris Fischbach of Coffee House Press. I really like what Chris does, how he approaches art making, collaboration, literature, and community building. I'm not going to tell you much more. I'm just going to get right into the conversation. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Chris. So you're Chris Fischbach, and are you the executive director or the publisher of Coffee House? Publisher, I mean, it's the same as executive director. Yeah. Yeah. Similar job. Mm Mm-hmm. Which is so it's, but it's publisher, so it's executive director and artistic director. Oh, so nice. it's both. That's so, a lot. And yeah. Do you have a managing director? Is there someone who does the? Yeah, my number two is Caroline Casey, and she was marketing director, and she's managing director now. And so she does a lot of kind of upper level strategy stuff with me, and then in terms of, and then she manages a certain amount of the staff, and um, but then we have an accountant who does a lot of the financial mm-hmm. stuff. I have a like a vague sense of what I would think uh, the head of a publishing company does, but it's vague. And mm-hmm. I, I don't know how how much of that is because that job does change day to day or how much of it is because no one talks about that. Like when people talk about writing, they talk about writers, not, and maybe editors. So I'm curious for you, like what is your relationship to the actual written piece? Like how much of it is you just love to get a writer in front of a reader and how much of it is like do you feel like you're directly doing that and how much are you doing sort of the sideways parts of making that happen Does um makes sense i think we're or not maybe um <laughs> i mean it's we, we're connect you know we're like the well sometimes people say they're the uh we're the uh midwife kind of thing oh yeah right? yeah that's a good uh, description uh, yeah. and so it's you know not entirely necessary but <laughs> but um but a good idea yeah it would <clears> suck <throat> without like right the pain would be greater right yeah and so it's we make help to make the work better and then we if you're just doing you know self-publishing for instance then everything is on you and you don't might necessarily have a lot of expertise yeah uh but we are professionals and so we have connections we have we know what we're doing with design editing marketing and just the relationships we've built with vendors and bookstores and our reputation over the years so it's we provide all this you create a path for yeah. the for the whatever the book or the yes. product is yeah and then we what we also do at coffee house or at a smaller place is yeah. that we provide a context an aesthetic context so like if you're with random house you might be one of a hundred novels coming out but at coffee house you're going to be one of four in the season and they're going to be kind of aligned aesthetically somehow. Hmm. And so that means that booksellers and reviewers will have more of a sense already just that they see it's a coffee house book. That's interesting that being with a like a, a smaller set of folks can actually make it easier for those sellers to understand what the book is than mm-hmm. you'd think a big company would have a lot of sort of marketing muscle to help tell you this is what this book is. They you do get have lost a, in the shuffle, I imagine. Yeah, you, they do have a lot of marketing muscle, and they can make they can make that happen. You're seeing it right now with kind of George Saunders. Yeah, is a great author, nice and guy. He's been around forever too. Yeah, and he gets, but he gets. They throw a lot of marketing muscle behind him, hmm. and you know there are others too. And they, they can they can do it, but it's you have to in any publishing house you have the you wait to see who the winner is going to be or where people are paying attention, mm-hmm. and then the marketing muscle goes toward that. Whereas at a smaller place, we try to even that out mm-hmm. and do things differently. We just don't have the money to do that either. Right. So you have to be creative. Mm-hmm. Can you um, just can you a little bit more talk about what specifically Coffee House Press, like what it does and what is its aesthetic? Because I have a, right. a sense of it, but I wonder how you talk about like who is Coffee House? Like what does that mean? Right. Well, I'm trying to remember. I just rewrote our mission statement. <laughs> this is kind of unfair so, of me. I mean, it's no. I mean, it's uh, and I don't. So I don't have the exact wording, but it's uh, we, Coffee House Press pr- creates spaces for audience and audiences and artists to interact, inspiring readers and enriching communities by expanding the idea of what literature is, what it can do, and who it belongs to. 
Mm. Okay, that's that's good because I could never remember that. That's that is great. The, that is the mission yeah. statement, and I think the idea being that we now we'll move on to the vision statement, which yeah, is just sure. like, you know we'll be, <laughs> to be the premier nonprofit literary publisher in the country, expanding ways that literature is distributed and experienced by people, and then hoping to make literature more relevant to more people by evangelizing mm. uh, our innovations. But the overall aesthetic, I guess I would say, is, you know, border crossing, which is genre crossing. It's experimental, innovative. It has part of the mission that says who literature belongs to is that we try to publish as many different kinds of people as possible. We want literature on our bookshelves to look like the country itself. And so that's that's kind of how we're known as un- uncategorizable, uncategorizable yeah. uh, in many ways. It's, it's like when... One thing I like is when I hear a bookseller say, I don't really know how to describe a coffeehouse book, but I know exactly what it is. Mm-hmm. When, I'm, when I'm holding it, I was like, yes, this is exactly it. Because I'm not quite sure how to talk about this. Yeah, but that seems harder to market. Yeah. I mean, Because I have that same relationship to your books, where mm-hmm. I'm like, this is a coffeehouse book. Like, I can see a book and not yeah. see the coffeehouse part right away, and I'm like, I, this feels like it's a coffeehouse. And it it's really good. is. It's good. Yeah. But I, it, the same, like, I don't know how to communicate that feeling. <laughs> Yeah, and or I'll, when I go to um, the Frankfurt Book Fair, so I'm meeting other editors who are pitching me their books. Mm. What I will say to them is, I want you to tell me about the books on your list that you love so much, but that no other publisher will touch mm. because they're afraid that they won't be able to sell them. Because mm. I want to sell those books, yeah. and it's risky, and but it's fun, and I think we've. We used to shy away from that sometimes, like if during financial problems, you know, like, oh, maybe we should sell something that's a little more commercial or not as quite as weird. But then those books actually don't do as well. And so right. it's really like double down on our aesthetic and don't apologize for it. Yeah. And our readers are there. That sounds very similar to me to this idea, especially now in sort of the modern digital direct connection to your audience mm-hmm. world of artists approaching audience development with find a thousand people who will like deeply love what you make is way more powerful than a hundred thousand people who are largely passive. Yeah. Is that similar to this? For sure. We don't need to sell hundreds of thousands of books. It's like if we sell, if, we, if you, if I had to sign a, a contract, that was like, you will sell 5,000 copies of every single book you will publish. I would probably do it because that would be a success across the board every time. But it wouldn't be, we'd have to give up the occasional selling 20, 50, hundred thousand yeah. copies. But you know that core five thousand is crucial. If we can, if we can get that and then build on it, it would be fantastic. Yeah. Well, let's, I would love to get into your relationship to books and writing and reading, mm-hmm. because you aren't. I mean, your job is not to write books. Your job is to find those people and, like you said, sort of help them birth, <laughs> birth their babies out into the world. Where, can you track your relationship to your love of literature and people reading literature? Like from my youth? Yeah, I mean, were uh, yeah. you a heavy reader? Were you writing? What were I, you? I didn't, well, in junior high or whatever, elementary school, high school, I didn't consider myself someone who was always reading. I didn't read a ton. No one ever said that's a nerdy kid who goes to the library all the time. I went to the library. Yeah. You know, I did read. Um, but it wasn't, that wasn't what I did. I, wasn't your identity. It wasn't my identity. Yeah. And then and I didn't write. And then in college, I decided to become an English major. I, I thought I was going to be poli-sci, but then uh, I took a boring class. And then I took a, an interesting English class and really liked it. Oof, and so life hangs on that yeah, <laughs> one professor. I know, I know. I won't say who it was. <laughs> it wasn't Paul Wellstone, because he was at... Well, he was. He was just left. Can't college, imagine college. teaching a boring class. No, he, I wish I would have had a class for him. And so then in college, I got interested in... I started to try to write, uh, and I did write some. Mm. Um, and I th- you know, by the end of college, I was like hardcore English major and was writing all the time. You know, I bought a manual typewriter and all that. And nice. I was into like beat literature and all that kind of stuff. I was like the typical like twenty-one-year-old English st- student, and you know, like lots of coffee and cigarettes and st- stupid. But um, then I graduated and I applied to go to the U of M creative writing. It wasn't MFA then. It was like a hybrid master's in English creative writing. And I didn't get in. And like now I know because like most of my stuff was bad. Well, it's a small group of folks. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, I think eventually I probably would have gotten into somewhere. Yeah. But then I, um, and it, I was still writing, and I didn't know what it meant to be a poet or anything. I didn't have any necessarily career path. And so then I talked. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't want to teach. Uh, and then an alumni, an alumna, told me, oh, there's all these great publishing houses. Are you interested in publishing? And I said, maybe. So, yeah, I took an uh, internship at Coffee House. I applied to Coffee House and Milkweed and didn't get the Milkweed one. And like the Coffee House one, I didn't get the normal internship. Hmm. But we have letterpress. There, yeah. Or we did. We had letterpress internships. And so they offered me that. And... I did it, um, and so there I continued to read and write poetry, and I learned from Alan Kornblum, our founder, about how to typeset, you know, lead type, one letter at a time, and he was also a talker and a storyteller, so he, I kind of got an education in that back press room from him. Then there was a normal internship, uh, the editorial and marketing altogether, which I did, and then I kind of did another one on top of it and then they off they needed like someone to do five dollar an hour database entry so of course i did that and then the editorial assistant quit and i applied for the job and got it and then ever since then it's just sort of i just rose up through mm-hmm. the ranks and a big thing that happened was there was an ed and a publisher then when i was first hired and so alan was more of an artistic director but then the press couldn't afford both so he became publisher like i am mm-hmm which meant I had a lot more editorial duties. And so a lot of times in a small press, editorial rises to the top. That's like generally the path because it's a vision-led organization. And that's, I mean, to driving the aesthetic and the, right. yeah, the actual content. And you're also proofreading all the grants and the marketing materials. Right. So you're learning yeah. that. So all you know, the first few years of working there, I continued to write and I became interested in public art and performance uh, but then gradually, I think I saw, well, I saw also that I wasn't going to be, I wasn't going to change the world of poetry. Like, I wasn't that good. Like, I was fine. Right. Like, I could probably get a book published because I knew how to do things. Right. But it wasn't important to me any longer. But I think that rather than say that I gave up writing, it's more that both I found creative satisfaction in editing, but also that I think a lot of the gestures that I make as an arts administrator, I think of as artistic gestures. Mm -hmm. So I think artfully and in an art context when I'm making decisions. Um, I mean, maybe financial ones, but more around like strategic around programming and that kind of stuff. So it's, I still consider myself an artist in that way. It's just, I'm not actually doing, I'm not writing. Yeah. But I, uh, you made me think of like a dozen questions, but one you mentioned that experience, that early experience with setting type, mm-hmm. and I wonder if you can talk about what that, how that maybe changed your relationship to books, that awareness of that that level of human interaction with the making of books. Did it have an impact in that way? Um, let's see. Uh, it makes you hyper aware of artifice. <laughs> I guess I mean or that because it's one idea that in a lot of art but in, in literature in my, at least in my field is th- people don't necessarily want to see the art they want to look past it yeah. and escape so they can put themselves into, in there yeah into yeah. a story which is fine and that's great um, but that's not something that informs my aesthetic mm-hmm. like I'm interested in realizing that I am experience experiencing a work of art and I think setting type that way, like one letter at a time, brings that out. And it also informs the idea of space on a page. Mm. Um, and so thinking about not only is it artifice, but it is physical space. And literature isn't usually thought of necess- as that way. It's storytelling. I mean, it's yeah. a book, maybe. But it's uh, it takes up... A, it's physical, I guess is what I mean. Like, there's there's something there... And so that transformative, that, that was a transformative moment for me, I think, is making the, that, the connection between or deciding that it was physical and spatial. I think that probably led me to think a lot about the different ways that literature can be experienced in the world. And then that combined with some of the interest in public art kind of led to some of our new pr- kinds of programming. Yeah, because one thing you're you're doing, and it, I mean, it's coffee house press, but it feels like, it, I mean, you're the guy, so you're either 
either just saying yes and often saying like, oh yeah, how do we, how can we play outside of the normal mm -hmm. mediums? Because thinking about publishing on like a coffee sleeve doesn't seem profound in some ways because there's text on coffee sleeves a lot. Sure. But then at the same time, people would say, but that's not publishing. So in that way, it does feel like you're upsetting how people think about, is yeah. this literature? Right. Well, that's one thing we say in a lot of our books is literature is not the same thing as publishing. Mm -hmm. And we're in the literature business and publishing is one thing that we do to connect readers or to put um, that art out in the world. You know, one of my favorite things that we did that illustrates this is we published a book by Andy Sturdevant, who's been on your show. Yeah. And it largely, I mean, you know the book, but your listeners might not, um, is uh, essays about uh, walking around cities, about public art, um, about his experiences, personal essays, but really about city as artistic medium, I guess mm -hmm. is a good way of putting it. And so we got a grant from a local foundation that we hired or commissioned, I think, 10 different artists who work in the public realm in Minneapolis to take an essay and turn it into a public art project. So one of the essays was about uh, the art art world kissing, um, which is like, you know, kissing hello. Like maybe you don't know how to do that, so here's a lesson. And so um, Supergroup, the local theater troupe, they took that essay and they did kissing lessons on the light rail platform, like to anyone who showed up or who yeah. was in the, yeah. tra in the train. Anyone willing, essentially. And was willing, yeah. <laughs> And then one other thing we did, there's an essay called Walking to Matt's Bar in a Blizzard. And so where Andy goes to Matt's Bar in a Blizzard and sits and listens to some Roxy music and has a cheeseburger. And we, the people who worked on that one were Kate Casanova, wait, Chris Coza and Kate Casanova, a musician and a video artist. And so they created this cool sound and videoscape of found footage like from tv shows of that particular blizzard uh and then also made a kind of soundscape to it and the idea being that we on the first heavy snowfall of that particular year we would meet outside of matt's bar and project it onto the wall um and play that for all the people passing by and then go inside and eat cheeseburgers and so everyone who kind of even saw that video passing by and was confused by it had an experience of literature, yeah. you know, um, and that's legit. And so that was, those kind of things I think are fun and interesting ways to think about how people can experience literature, how literature can be transformed and in, in where it is. This comes from a very like personal experience place I, as someone who like identifies as a comedy maker and mm -hmm. loves comedy and deeply believes in the artistic practice of comedy I still see a lot of struggle around having to convince people that versions of comedy are art and not something else. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how often you bump into that because you are doing something that is half the time the obvious fine art quality. Like even just there are people doing things with typesetting right now that is about the words, but it's also about the representation of the words and that is accepted by these sort of big literary art circles. Yeah. But I wonder how much you get people wanting to say, we need to have a discussion about whether this even counts as literature or what if this is outsider art and so outside that it's nothing. And, you know, how, how much are you engaged in those conversations? How much do you think about that before you move forward with something? Well, I, so I first had to start talking about it with my staff. Yeah, and so there's staff and, bo and <laughs> they board. They have to be on board with... and, and board, yeah, board directors, and so that was, and then people who want to participate in it, mm. um, the artists, and like, luckily here in Minneapolis, there's enough people kind of thinking outside the box, I think, because of very social practice and open field and stuff. But it's we have a hard time convincing funders to that this is kind of an additional thing that we might need funding for. Mm. Some people get it. Like if I can sit down and talk to Vicki Benson and the Big Night Foundation for an hour, like she got it. You know, she she understood what we were doing. But it was, I already had a relationship there and she was, you know, willing to listen and she's great. But it's when I'm trying to find different kind of funding, I think it's a lot of what is this? And no, we don't fund 
books. You know, it, or you know, it's it's that it's it's not an easy thing to understand immediately. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and, and as for like the rest of the like the literary world or publishing, like I don't really care. Uh, I mean, I don't. I want. That's not true. Uh, I think that if literature doesn't evolve the same way that if drama or theater or orchestras don't evolve, that they will become less relevant to people. And so we are trying to adapt and make things more relevant for people. Uh, And other people who work in literature should be doing that if they want to remain relevant to a broad swath of people. Mm. And if I'm a part of our goal is to put it out there and for other people to see, and maybe other people will start doing it as well. So if, if they don't want to, then that's not my problem. <laughs> you know, I don't, they can go like, just be a publisher and just publish books. Yeah. Like, that's fine. Like there's a lot of, and that's not going to go away, but this is interesting, at least to me artistically. And I think it's important because I think literature can have more of a, or already does impact on the culture. Mm-hmm. There is a piece where if you, if you're not wrong for what you're doing, I think some folks who are locked in a certain way of thinking see that as, well, that means either I'm wrong or they're wrong. We can't both be doing something that are distinctive. And it sounds like most of you are like, yeah, I mean, that you can be worried about that, but I'm not worried about that. Right. I mean, I don't, and again, like we still are publishing and we're not going to stop publishing. Mm -hmm. So if someone is just publishing... I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that you need to be doing anything. Not everyone needs to be doing weird, arty stuff with literature. <laughs> or, like, it's not so arty, but, like, engagement. Yeah. And and that's um, that's fine. Uh, I think probably the funders who get it might be asking other people, like, hey, are you doing anything weird yeah. in public engagement like coffee houses? And I'm sure that's annoying. Yeah. It's helped us certainly with State Arts Board and McKnight and the NEA because I think some people do get it and they see that we're at least trying something new and different. It helps that I think I've attended all sorts of... I've been on grant panels. Mm-hmm. You know, I sort of know how to do foundation speak and I see how what we're doing can fit into a logic model and all that. So it's it's not just being a renegade and trying to go do stuff. It's actually then understanding... Well, like X Foundation doesn't, I don't deserve their money. Like I have to show them how what we do actually does fit into their goals. Mm. Um, And that's just about kind of shuffling words around into different parts of different applications. We're doing the work of really understanding what they're about as well. Yeah. Uh, You mentioned relevance and I think this ties into that. You know, I I actually recently had Nina Simon Mm. on, and she has The Art of Relevance, which I I really enjoy that book. And one framing I enjoy is she calls out people who spend a lot of energy trying to convince everyone they're relevant, and that's how they think of their marketing and their audience development, versus the idea that you have to see if you truly are, and if not, you maybe have to move a little bit to where the work you're doing is relevant. And it sounds like that is sort of an idea that's at play here of we're going to go bring this kind of literature out into this space where people already are existing because that's where the relevancy lives. Do you have to ever wonder, it doesn't sound like it's a big problem, but is there any evaluating and assessing ongoing to make sure you're not just trying to get some attention to drive people to buy the books? Well, we've always said that this is because a lot of people think, "Oh, you're, well, you're just doing marketing for your yeah. books." Yeah, like and stunts, we, right? And we like we insist. Well, a we we do we use we work with plenty of artists who are not our authors. Yeah. So um, there's no actual commercial. Right. Um, if you were doing that, you're doing it poorly. <laughs> right. Right. And so we're saying, no, this is actually this is content. Like it may have an impact on sales, but that's not why we're doing it. Nina is, I mean, I read Art of Relevance too, yeah. and I also I saw her great talk at um, the History Center about, yeah. about relevance. Yeah. And actually, that, a lot of that helped me, with, that gave me some vocabulary mm-hmm. to kind of talk further about this. Uh, I wasn't necessarily using the term relevant beforehand, before. Yeah. And, but I was like, oh, well, that is exactly what I yeah. meant. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Nina. And also making a, a, low, bar for, a low bar of entry is one that she talks yes, about that too. Which I love. And so I think that's the other thing is like, okay, if they're not going to, it, it's quite a thing to actually just go to a bookstore, find a coffee house book, and buy it. Like that's just like the odds of that happening in our country are very low, right? So it's 
it, it does happen, obviously, and we yeah. do lots of things to make it <laughs> to make it happen. Yeah, but, you have to make that as easy as possible. Right. So then it's also like, well, let's go out into the world and be external facing. And then if someone sees something happening or experiences them in some on a billboard or on a coffee sleeve or something like that, that's going to make it more likely that they may find its way back to a book. Or that there's, it's also a legit experience of just having a cup of coffee and reading a couple lines of poetry. I mean, you know, some people ask me, are you just doing this stuff for grants? And the answer is, you know, absolutely not. Because, I mean, it's helped with some, but it's not like suddenly we have all this new funding coming our way. And let me see, did I answer the question? Yeah, I think you did. Okay, I mean, right. it, you, you, it sounds like you do make, just because of the way you're approaching the work, that's not a big issue. Cause right you're not even thinking of it as primary practice to be driving people to make purchases. That's not, that's right. not the reason. So one thing that we did, because um, I do have to think about, uh, if you run an organization and you pay people when they have insurance, like you have to have revenue. Yeah, that's irresponsible <laughs> if you're not. <laughs> right, right. Is there a revenue model for this? Like what, if we are providing relevance to something, how can that be made into... Yeah, revenue. You yeah. Know, not necessarily profit, but just how can it pay for itself? Right. Um, and so a couple different ways are that if we can do... these, One thing we do is do these residency models where writers go into a space, they're there to be creative, to shine a light on that space, that archive, that library, and then they collaborate with that space to create new art. And so we've done that 30 sometimes now. And we've done it so often and also track evaluations and all that for it that we were able to attract the Hennepin County Library was like, well, you should do that in some of our libraries and we have legacy funds. And so basically, can we hire you to do this in our library? And so we've done that three times. Uh, and that's a model, a revenue model. Um, yeah, that's like direct services kind of. Right. Yeah. And so that, and that is kind of longer term thinking around strategies for that is like, okay, that's part of it. And then also, can we create a kit some kind of kit um, that allows people that we don't have to run it and other people can get this some kind of kit for whatever, how much that costs, I don't know. Um, it just tells them how to do it as best practices and evaluation tools and all that kind mm. of stuff. Uh, but then the other thing is that sometimes there's like a, a circle diagram that we think about where we have our books and our projects and books and projects. So one project was that we were very active with Little Free Libraries and giving them books um, and then eventually we worked with Little Free Library to create a book about Little Free Libraries. And so that, the project then turned into a book. And so that's the idea is that sometimes our books will turn into projects, sometimes projects will turn into books. Um, and sometimes there will just be projects and just books. Um, so that's, that's also how I think about the revenue for it. In addition to trying to figure out, is there a donated path? Or is there some kind of crowd funding or membership path yeah yeah because um, if you're building people who are invested in the idea of what you're doing mm -hmm. what is the return on that investment right and this is like like i said we're going through strategic planning right now and i don't know the answers to this and partly it's been there's no model for what we're doing in publishing and so it's trying a lot of different things and seeing what sticks and then evaluating them and kind of moving forward so it's i don't i have a kind of managed chaos management style, mm -hmm. um, which I'm fine with. Not everyone is fine with it, <laughs> but I don't. And then I think it's just figuring something out, following it, the success and having faith that it will be okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have to make a decision and then justify the hell mm -hmm. out of it. Spend all your time making sure it was the right decision. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm curious because you took over, was it 2014 or 2015 when did you move into the oh uh, no 2011 oh okay sorry to cut years That's off okay. here 10 years well alan died in 2014 okay that so that was yeah, yeah. popping yeah. in my brain but you took over something from the guy who started the thing yep and there are plenty of people who come into that a leadership role after that's already happened you know you're not the transition from the person who started it mm -hmm. so that's a very specific relationship and you worked there already so you had a relationship with alan so i wonder what you were thinking in starting the job you have now? Like if if the pressures were specific around nurturing the relationship with Alan as well as you're protecting something that means something to this person, that can also be a reason to not try new things mm -hmm. because there's 
there can be the implication that I'm trying new things because you were doing it wrong. I don't, I don't necessarily see that, but I, I think you get anxiety about that. So I wonder how you've thought about your job as steward of a thing, having known really well the person who made it real. It's, um, well, he, I was, he got sick shortly after I took over. Mm -hmm. So he got cancer and struggled with it for four years. Uh, and then died. So it was in one hand, like he, he was very hands off. Some part of with non Hodgkin's lymphoma, you can be very healthy for a while. Mm -hmm. Right. And so he was, and, but he was surprisingly hands off with me. Um, I was kind of, I was just surprised and I'm really proud of him for being that way because I was worried that it would be difficult. And he was still kind of on as a founder. Like he was he on was staff. Still, yeah. Yeah. He was contract with the board for a set, set amount of money for a year um, that sunsetted after five years. Mm -hmm. And let's see, he, so he didn't, then he didn't really have the energy. So there wasn't, I don't know what it would have been like had he been really healthy and active and wanting to work there for 20 years. Cause I think part of his plan was I'd like to work here for 20 years. Mm -hmm. We didn't have to deal with that, you know, sadly. Yeah. But there's, you know, sometimes he, he would, I had to, one thing I had to do was differentiate myself from him. You know, there was a certain amount, like, I'm a very different person than he was. Mm -hmm. So people who knew both of us knew that already. But in terms of being a leader and kind of setting, uh, not kind of resetting, you know, you reset your iPhone, it's mostly still there, but it's fresher and different or something. Yeah. And then I also needed to see that I needed to differentiate Coffee House from Grey Wolf and Milkweed here in town mm -hmm. in terms of that. And so it's part of what I could do is some of these new ideas that I have. Um, and it's funny because he, one time Alan would say, he said to me, you know, I can see that what you're doing is kind of an offshoot of what I was proposing for something on the website. And I was, I was like, I don't think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was like, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, and you're better to let that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I didn't need to, it didn't matter. Like it was, um, and I was actually glad that he was able, that he thought that. Because, yeah, I could have be been like, what are you doing? Just publish books. Yeah. You know, because that's what was important to him. I think if I had veered too far away aesthetically or if I had said, for sure, like, get rid of all the letterpress equipment, you know, we don't want that anymore, there would have been problems. But there was enough of an overlap in our aesthetics that he was happy with it, I think. He didn't, I mean, he never, we always had a, an agreement uh, ever since I'd been on staff for about five years that we could each pub like if one of us didn't like a book that the other wanted to publish that there was like one book a year that you could always like it didn't matter mm -hmm. like i could put forward a book and say we're going to publish this and he wouldn't say no even if he hated it yeah and so but, but there also was that didn't really happen there was enough of an overlap that um but then it shifted and it's one thing that's hard is the people where who weren't didn't overlap the aesthetics um who are no longer on the list and that's a really tough um it's harder on them than it is on me but it wasn't an easy thing for me to do hmm. um because there's a lot of anger when you have uh transitions and things change how do you think about it now in the idea that you are responsible for somebody's legacy like is that on your mind much what role does that play in your i don't i don't know how much i think about it i guess i just i trust that I am, I don't have control over it, maybe. I, I'm doing yeah, what yeah. I think, I don't think he would have a problem with what I was doing, what I'm doing. I think it's consistent with what he did and what he wanted. And so that will be for someone else to decide, I guess. It's, and I also, I just, yeah, I don't really worry about it. I think sometimes his um, wife, Cinda, comes in and, you know, picks up books. And I talk to her and I think it's then that I yeah, kind of think, yeah, I'm yeah. like, oh, is she, <laughs> I hope I'm doing okay. I don't want Cinda to be mad at me, but she, you know, seems great. And, um, yeah, I, I think that there will be, there was a certain amount of time where I had to not talk about, if I want to make the press kind of my own, where I didn't talk about Alan a whole lot. It yeah. was about like, that's the past This I'm about now and going forward. Um, but I, feel like now or for a while now it's been like okay i think i don't need You've to worry i don't yourself. need to worry about that anymore yeah um like yeah so it's 
I think I'm an okay place for that. I, I don't. I think there's still some work to be done on securing his legacy in the public realm, mm-hmm. um, and I'm trying to figure out how to do that. I wonder if this, this is not a. Um, this has not come from any underground rumors, but I wonder if you. Another thing that is hard when you're leading an organization is often we don't plan for what's going to happen when I'm not here anymore. Mm-hmm. And so I'm not, I'm not planting the seed for you leaving. You're young. You have a lot of time. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, how do you think about that? Because you had such a good transition for yourself. And how do you, you know, you want to, I would imagine you want that to be true for whatever would happen after you're not there. Yeah. We, um, and he, to his credit, he put the transition in motion, which a lot of founders don't. It was a, it took a while. Yeah. Intentionally, right? Yes. Yeah. And um, that, a lot of other publishers, he would talk to them about it, old guys from his generation, and they didn't want to talk about it. And he was so mad because he's like, all those books are just going to go out of print. Yeah. So it's something that actually, that will be an important part of the legacy, I think, is that sometime soon, yeah, like I need to talk to the board. Like we have to have just like a general Right, I don't want to freak anyone out. I'm not right. announcing anything, but yeah. Right. And it's interesting because some of them asked me, you know, do you get job offers and I said well there was only really been not an offer but one conversation that happened and I didn't talk to them really yeah and they're always like you should always talk to people and so the board even like there's people on the board yeah. who like encourage that but they're not encouraging me to leave no but because sometimes those conversations just reinforce where you want to be totally the yeah it's sometimes soon there'll have to be some planning around that both you know emergency at the first there should be some kind of emergency plan mm-hmm. and then it's funny to not it's like, I don't, it's hard to get those going or it's, you know, cause somebody will be like, I'm sure the board will figure something out yeah. if I died tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> um, it won't be your problem. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah. And then it becomes a question of like, I, hopefully it's, I don't plan on leaving. So let's say I'm here for, you know, 20 to 30 more years. My wife and I argue about retirement <laughs> age and it would be at least 20. God. At some point I have to start thinking like, kind of like him, like, are, is there someone on staff at that point who I would could identify as like oh, let's start molding them as leadership material. Yeah. Whether or not it ends up being the case, like at least there is this potential. Yeah. And I, that's something I actually enjoy is a lot. I found is one of the favorite parts of my job is helping younger people in their careers and like helping them find successes. So you mentioned your wife. Mm-hmm. You you have one of those. Yes. Now you have a life outside of coffee house. No. Well, that's what, <laughs> that's what I'm curious about because you you have a job where you could I think you could literally put as much of time as it would take any time you offer like yep. you can keep pouring more and more time into it yep. and that's lovely because I know I know you as a person I know you really care about the work like you're not doing it because of the sweet sweet paycheck you're doing it because it right. means a lot to you but it also means you can build all your relationships around the work and not have be a whole person like who Chris existing outside of coffee house. Where are you at? Like, how do you, how are you strategic about making sure you have a personal relationship with your wife and, uh, you have people who you can go do other things with that is not about this or do you go, Oh, I, that's a good idea, but I'm not doing that at all. Um, I need to do more of it. Yeah. That's um, why I brought it up. Your yeah. wife called me. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Well, she works in publishing too, so yeah, it's, actually, it's pretty yeah. hard. That's both good and bad. Yeah. So we understand. We don't have to explain the problems. Yeah. They're there. Uh, yeah. And I think a lot of it is you build in, in a town this size. It's also if the arts community is the arts community, and then if you're in the middle of it, it's all kind of work. Right. You know, like going to King Lear was kind of work. Yeah. You know, I'm looking at the program, looking at the funders, thinking about arts administration. So it's. <laughs> but I think for me, it's there's college friends. Mm. And I think that's where, like, I they're not here for the most part. So it's like when I travel to see them, it's an intentional thing. And that's kind of a, like, safe space that's not work. And I don't right. feel judged there or no one is there because they want something from me or anything like that. So there's a certain amount of, like, those friends are a safe haven for me. I wish more of them lived here. Yeah. But, um, so, but that's... Uh, that's something, but it's something Katie and I talk about. It was like, well, we should actually try to find some friends who are not in the arts at all. Well, I, don't, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I don't know what I would talk <clears throat> about with those people. <laughs> TV. I guess. <laughs> that's art. Uh, yeah. 
I, for a while, I worked at a golf course uh-huh. on Sundays um, until I was until like seven years ago, um, and so that was something. And are you a golfer? I I was. I can do it still. I'm not. I'm. I get mad at myself. I'm hard on myself in general, and so golf is a bad thing. It's a frustrating game. Yeah. yeah, and I need in order to be not frustrated, you have to do it a lot. I don't have the time or money to do that. So I either need to change my lifestyle and or outlook on life. <laughs> or I don't know. To fundamentally um, change who you yeah, are, but right. then it would be yeah. Um, but it's it was like it's in my family. Everyone golfed in my family, mm-hmm. so that was what we did. And you know, there's my parents are in Arizona for half the year. I'm going down to see them. You know, and Katie and I go on vacations. And so it's I mean I, we work a lot, yeah. yeah. And so it's like we should find more than that. I turn, you know, it's nine o'clock at night, and they're like I'm I don't have my computer on after that really Mm. uh it's not like i'm working until then it's just like sometimes you know you cook together and then you go on email for an hour yeah of course and so um sometimes and then we have (laughs) we watch right now right now we're like making our way through reruns of mary tyler moore what a great show yeah it's wonderful yeah and so tv is actually a big a big part like i people are surprised like i watch two hours of tv a day well, I like, so you work in books. You get to be the person who's like, I got to make more time for TV. Like yeah. everyone else is like, I, this year I'm going to read more. Yeah. And you're like, I got that covered. Yeah, that, exactly. That's happening. Mm-hmm. Off the clock truly is like TV time. I, the, I am curious about your relationship with the artists of Coffee House, which isn't just over like authors now. It is other kinds of weirdos. You mm-hmm. know, like that. that is a thing I've loved about the way my pro- projects have gone beyond theater that now my circle of friends and community is still mostly artists but it's not all people in the same discipline as mine so i wonder if you feel like you have some deep relationships with people who were they're ostensibly like i don't know if they're clients or what the word is to describe uh someone whose work you're helping make but do you feel like those have you had a lot of those transition from the professional to the personal or you know and then how do you navigate that where you have a friend who wants a book published and you're like I want to still be friends, but this doesn't fit. Like, what do you, how do yeah. those relationships work? It's hard. Um, sometimes it's not a problem. Mm-hmm. And other times, like, it can become a problem. If people get unhappy, one side becomes unhappy, then that's not easy to deal yeah. with. But yeah, there have been plenty of people who I become, I mean, I find it like it's, it comes and goes. Like, you can be close to someone for a while, and then maybe either like they go to a different publisher. How do you then, feel about that? Uh, well, a lot of times it's for a lot of money, mm-hmm. and so I don't necessarily, I don't really <laughs> yeah. knock people for that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's it can be a bummer. Do but... you shout sell out at them? No, yeah. <laughs> no. I hope I shout like here's our donation letter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you would like to share right? some of that money? Yeah. You you spin the narrative mm-hmm. in that case. But then, yeah, there are plenty of people who have become good. It's hard to say friend exactly. I mean, I think friendly. Yeah. But it's one thing that Alan said to me, which I want to avoid, was he said, like, I used to have a lot more friends in town. And basically, like, as the longer you work, the fewer friends that you actually have. Mm. And to me, like, that was terrifying. I was like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. You know, and so it's, I don't want that to happen. I think that's part of actually what drove me to also be friends with people in visual arts and performing arts, too. So it's also like there's less... Right, they don't yeah. want something. From right, you. right. They're not going to publish a book, and so um, was I like going? It's there was someone who one thing that was really touching was a, a per, per, an author that I care about quite a bit, and she said something which was like meeting you was one of the best things that ever happened in my life, and I don't mean to say I'm not saying that to make it sound self-aggrandizing, but like that's the kind of thing you a human likes to hear. Yes, occasionally. Please, I'd like that. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like. And that that kind of thing makes it really that was worthwhile, and so it's moments like that, and so but those are not usual. Yeah, uh, I feel like I can't not ask a little bit about the world of physical books. Mm-hmm. Like I, I from what I know about you and the work, I don't, I don't get that you're terribly worried. But we we still are in a place where there's the ongoing new article from the ma- news or the magazine about print is dead and often they try to newspaper but sometimes that's also book world mm-hmm. i'm in my own throes of i have a digital thing i can read on but i am still i still fetishize paper books it just feels and smells right to me 
you seem like you're willing to play in a multitude of spaces. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I'm not. I don't really. I'm not a fan of ebooks. I yeah. have an e-reader, but that's for reading manuscripts. Yeah. The I prefer physical books, and it's actually physical books are like there was all those articles for a while, and there was the prediction that books would go over everything, like and that actually just like stopped. Yeah. Like it's reached a certain point where certain genres. Like things just went to their corners. Yeah. Like certain genres, you know, there's a lot of ebook soul, you know, mysteries and romance uh, genre type stuff. Um, but then, like literary stuff, literary books, there's a, that's actually growing. Yeah, like it's like it went down a little bit, but it's been going up. Uh, in, uh, independent booksellers, there's more booksellers opening, um, and so it's I'm not worried about that. And within the industry, there's not a lot of worry anymore. Um, but there was a lot of trying to figure it out for a while, um, a lot of rushing to E, and but it's not something I can't. Well, I can't control it right. either, <laughs> um, and so uh, that's, that's, a, that's very uh, Buddhist of you, but right. also accurate. Right. Well, we you know so we have eBooks. All of our books are made into eBooks unless there's a physical reason why there's not. So if suddenly everyone stopped buying paper books, they would buy our eBooks, and you know we hedged our bets there. But it's not something that I'm interested in. Like if, in terms of innovation or going down a special road, that's electronic is not what interests me. It was, it was more analog. And it's different with journalism, for sure. Um, and But the electronic world has had a larger effect on publicity, how people find out about books. So it's less the ebook than just the fact of the internet. Hmm. That's been more important. The fact of the internet. Yeah. I like that term, that <laughs> phrase. <laughs> Uh, what can you speak to the um, the realities of making a living as a a writer? I mean, is that and that is a big word like writer. So I know you're yeah. in a specific area, but that's a conversation you're deeply engaged in because the people you're working with, plenty of them have they have to have multiple revenue streams. You know, their tables have to have lots of legs. I mean, that's true. I think with almost any artist now. Yeah, yeah. Very few people can make a living as a publishing books yeah um and it's most of our i bet the majority of our writers also teach mm. i'm guessing at some level and that kind of started happening you know 15 20 years ago i guess like that was how writers they taught writing so you have this whole like industry now of writers turning out more writers mm. and who then also teach yeah <laughs> right it's, i actually can't it's not really sustainable in yeah. the long run it's you don't yeah you, i mean you're gonna make a few thousand dollars a year maybe and then it's also, can you supplement it, you know, with speaking fees? Mm-hmm. You have to do lots of different things, you know, lots of multi-platform, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's, you they, probably, if you're become a certain level of well-known and if you're a, a decent speaker and, and or entertainer, there's a lot more money to be had there than in the actual books themselves. So it's like, can you leverage the book? The book sells tickets things? to your live events. Right. Yeah. And there's one poet that we have uh, coming up that become, he's very, very good at, traveling around the country and getting paying gigs to read his poetry. Mm. And I think he's actually almost making a living on it at this point. I don't know. He's not rich, but I think like that's There's what he does. There's a big difference between making a living <clears throat> yeah. and rich, although it's... And then you get, yeah, because sometimes people, like Kao Kulia Yang, the late homecomer, you know, she, we published her first book and it went on to sell 100,000 copies. And she, at first, was not a great speaker. And now, like, she can make um, stadiums full of people cry. And she can she gets you know sometimes she does stuff for free sometimes it's for five hundred yeah sometimes she gets twenty thousand yeah. dollars and so it's uh that's really she's a kind of a good model for what a writer can do or what what you can do to make a living like I guess she I don't know if she couldn't it's not just her books but her book and her speaking like that's a pretty solid living yeah mm-hmm. are there sort of as we wrap up to the end of this um are there projects in 2017 or the future that you can talk about that you're really excited about coming out of yes. House? There, we just sent a book to the print to the printer. So Valeria Luiselli is a Mexican writer living in New York that we've been publishing for a while. We've done her first three books. And she published an essay in Freeman's Journal about her work with undocumented Latin American children who are facing deportation in New York City. She was she translates for them, mm. trying to kind of if you answer a certain kind of questions in a certain way, you you either will be deported or you can stay if you're facing danger at home or whatever. So she wrote this essay, and it's also about why 
people come to the U.S., um, even though they're facing racism, what's the appeal, uh, but also how really the U.S. is implicated in a larger uh, reason why people are trying to come here in the first place in terms of like appetite for drugs, right. essentially, this giant market. So it's all one thing. We're pushing people here. Kind of, yeah, and yeah. And making it hard to be here. Yes. So she published this essay, and it was short, and then she expanded it and published it in Spanish with her Mexican publisher. And so it's book length. And she wasn't going to publish it here because it had partially been in this journal already, but also it there's some something to do with her new novel that she's working on. So it, there's some overlap there. But she and I were talking shortly after the election, and she said, well, maybe we should do this book now. And I said, yes, <laughs> please. And yeah, that so, seems like that has to happen. <clears throat> yeah, we basically rushed it to print. Hmm. We had to retranslate it into English. It was a very complicated process. We had our production editor was on maternity leave, so her re- temporary replacements kind of got thrown this enormous project. And everyone on staff just like worked really hard. We got pro bono um, immigration lawyer to vet it, and it was just and so it's you know it's a 130 page book that's so incredibly powerful that um, it kind of also helped a lot of us deal with. The election results is like we're this is what we're doing this is what we can do yeah. solid to help something and it's just set to print so we're waiting to see now it'll come back and then it will hit the world and hopefully it'll make some kind of difference but it's like it makes people cry like it's a great great book and it's really inspiring and that's something that you know was totally unplanned for we magically got a twenty thousand dollar grant to help with it like someone just randomly called one day it was like we want to support a project I was like, I have a project. It's a great phone call. <laughs> and so, it's, is that that'll be out in the spring? It'll be, well, or yeah. So we rushed it outside of the normal publication yeah. schedule. It's at the printer, and we printed 500 emergency copies for an event in San Francisco on the 21st of February, and then we've printed 10,000 uh, other copies for our start to start with because we feel like that we for sure are going to be able to sell 10,000. Yeah, it'll basically, it will come out in the middle to late March is when okay. it'll be available. And what's um, it called? Uh, Tell Me How It Ends, a essay in 40 questions. So that's something that's very much on my mind right now. Yeah, I want to read that. Mm-hmm. You will. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, where can people go to connect with both you online mm-hmm. and then Coffee House in general, Coffee House Press in general? What's the so, best? Coffeehousepress.org and then, of course, Facebook. And then it's coffee underscore house underscore at uh on twitter uh i don't remember what our instagram is but you can probably find it you're smart (laughs) um and i'm fish at fish mpls is my twitter yeah excellent well chris i really appreciate you talking to me yeah thanks for having me well here we are again it's always such a pleasure remember when you tried to kill me twice we laughed and laughed, except I wasn't laughing under the circumstances I'd been chucking. So bad Go make something